What follows for the inaugural episode of the Hard Part Podcast is a conversation with a nine-year PGA Tour player. He shared the course record at the Players' Championship, equal to the record set by Fred Couples and Greg Norman. He finished second place behind Bill Haas at the AT&T National and finished second again in 2016 at the Wells Fargo Championship. He was a four-time All-American at Georgia Tech, recipient of the NCAA Top 8 Award, and is currently the host of the Course Record Podcast. I'm Jason Hodges, and here I bring you an in-depth, insightful, and intriguing conversation with Roberto Castro. I'm talking to Roberto Castro as I just introduced him in a video by myself that he didn't actually see, but all nice things you've said about it. Really? I haven't. Even, I don't think I have any negative things to say about you. Maybe we need to get to know each other better. <laughs> well, well thanks for coming on, man. This whole nexus as you know behind this was go over the good parts of your career your journey as a tour player okay or whatever you're trying to create actually tour players career is a creation of his own making or her own making of course if you wanted to talk about another thing that you've created that at some point got kind of difficult or complicated we can talk about that too okay i've got about half of my coffee left and you're at the end. So I was so nervous about this yeah. that I just chugged the chugged entire well, thing. Well, so. hopefully you're not going to crash. I'll just be drinking episode. out of an empty cup. If you crash, cup. maybe it'll start to be less caffeinated and more like darker. I don't know. I'll be drinking anyway, out of man, an empty cup. I don't think we've actually ever talked about this, but like your career on tour was nine years. Can you take me through maybe how it progressed and how it digressed and picked back up again? Sure. I think the premise of the conversation, as far as I understand it, you'd have to include the time before I got on the PGA tour. So three years on the mini tours, year ish on the, what's now the corn Ferry tour. So I kind of look at it as a, look at it as a 13, 14 year journey. Cool. What sticks out for you as perhaps a part where you felt like you were going backwards that you actually, but then you actually later maybe took, one step back to take two forward? Uh, two things. One, really, I, I just remember I was playing great on the mini tours. I won, I don't know, five, six, seven tournaments. One summer, I won like two of these. They had these big money tournaments. And I think I won two of them, and Kiz won at least one or two. And I'd made like $200,000 playing mini tours. And I went to first stage and shot 74, 74, 74, 74 after shooting 66 for an entire eight months. And that was probably the low point or the hardest part, like driving home from, I think it was in St. Augustine. Just like, what is the point of this? There's like, no, I'm, I am no closer to where I want to be than where I was 12 months ago. And the next time I can get there is 12 months from now. Cause that's how Q school works. So it was just such a bummer, like feeling like I'd had my best year ever had all this success but had what felt like nothing to show for it. Yeah. That was clearly in that three-year period before you got onto a yeah, so PGA I, Tour sanctioned tour. I think I have the story right, but I think I came home, was depressed for five days or something, and then got over it. And I think that winter, I went with two buddies to Serbia. We went to Prague. We went to Germany for like a 10-day trip. And then when life was good, like I was single, I'd made some money, took a great trip and then came home, made a plan to try to play mini tours until Monday qualifiers started, just put some cash in the bank. I think I won a tournament and then I Monday qualified that summer onto the corn Ferry tour. So actually about eight months later, after that hard part, I was on the corn Ferry tour and kind of on my way. So never made it through Q school. Actually Monday qualified my way to that next level. Yeah. I didn't actually realize that. Yeah. That's which isn't that unusual actually. Yeah. Like Spieth didn't make it through Q school and we've had similar careers since then. So you have, yeah. very. I would, I would say like the same trajectory, just different color hair. Yeah. Just three less zeros on my bank. <laughs> well, well, that's, that's pretty juicy there. So there was like a nine month period in there where you felt like you had what it took to play on the net. You probably always felt like you had what it took to play at the next level, but you had this seemingly seeming setback by not making Q school after beating the shit out of whoever 
on many tours. So where in there did it get con- complex or where in there did it, did you do anything that might illustrate some kind of lack of faith or lack of understanding that you were going to break through at the next point? Was there any moment in there? Really? I did this again later, lost my card a couple times on tour was really just like taking inventory of where I am today, what I have going for me and that the past doesn't really matter. So at that point I was 24 or something. Yeah. I had some money in the bank, had good friends, good family, like had a lot of things going for me. My game was incredible. Yeah. So if somebody was like, Hey, will you take that, that hand of cards? You'd say, sure. Yeah. Like next year I can go play well in the mini tours, get through. So that's kind of how I looked at it. And then later on when I was on tour, I kind of looked at it the same way. It was like, wow, this is not where I want to be. But at the end of the day, I have conditional status. I have a good coach. I have, you know, support or wherever I was at that moment is like, wow, the last six months have sucked. But a lot of people would take where I am today and the opportunities that I have. So that was kind of one strategy. Great. It was like you got back to your baseline of what was what you knew was there. That's right. And then you were like, I can still build on this. Yeah. How long did that take you? I mean, you didn't walk off the 18th or the 72nd hole of Q school and say, oh, well, I'm still here. I'm good. I can build. Where, Somewhere on that Europe trip, maybe, did you get a sense, come back to life? or I fell over like a tree trunk and almost landed on a curb in that Europe trip. So I could have died in the streets of Belgrade and didn't. So that gave me some perspective on New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve uh, morning. No, that's a good question. I think it really was like a week of kind of wandering around because you have this plan of like, okay, Q school starts in September. It goes through the first week of December. So I've, it's a three month process. I've got this plan. My vision is to do that. And then it ended. That's the, really the worst part is that if you, if you flunk out of first stage, that was probably mid September and many tours didn't start again. Even many tours didn't start again until February. So you're looking at the balance of September, October, November, December. January. I was five months from a tournament. Yeah. I look, I went on the Atlanta schools website to like look at substitute teaching, like just to do something. Yeah. Five months is a long time. Yeah. So that really was the biggest bummer. I've got some notes here. You can see down there that I've got some notes, but. Do you have anybody that you remember from that time period that helped you? You know, really, my coach at the time, Jeff Patton, who was a big mentor, I think he gave me some time, but then he helped me develop the plan to move forward, which was, hey, mini tours, January, February, March, bank as much cash as you can, was his theory, and then go Monday every week. Because the previous year, I had monday a few times and had some success. I'm pretty sure... I finished in the top 25 the last two tournaments of the web.com before Q school because I Mondayed in and was playing. I was like, I was well at that level, but if you don't get, so I think Jeff was, you know, helpful in that strategy, which was good strategy. I don't really remember what I did in October, November, December, but something. At some point in there, I probably saw you, right? Yeah. It, it goes without mentioning on this live platform at what kind of stuff we got into in our 20s. It's not necessary here. <laughs> it could, I was going to say that was the New Year's we were together in New York, yeah. but it wasn't because I think it was. You went to Belgrade. I think I, we were in, yeah, on the Euro trip. Was there anything in there in that time where you felt like you changed your perspective or your beliefs about something that you kind of held dear? No, I think that, though, was something I learned was like the lag effect. I think it applies to every business and everything that you try to do. Is there such a huge lag between effort and results? Not even effort, actually like skill set in the market and then results. Uh I think that happens on tour a ton where a guy is doing the right things and playing great, but you don't see it for 12 months later. And, and the flip side, you can be doing the wrong things and be skating on like your past efforts for about 12 months too. I remember when I had some bad golf that like 
a third of the way through the season, I'd be like, I'd like peel off a 20th or 10th and I'd be like in decent shape, but like the cracks in the foundation were there. So I think that applies to everything. Like you, you can have the skills, have the marketability, but it's not going to show up for a long time. Sales process is probably the same way. People that are in sales, you can be killing it for months and months, but you don't really harvest all your efforts for quite a while. I'm bound to respond to that by acknowledging the importance of really being engaged in what that preparation process is before the lag, you know, before the lag period. But what, what's your takeaway there? Like, I know you just said it, but what do you tell somebody about being encouraged or what do you tell your former self about being encouraged to stick it out there? I think you just have to trust that what you're doing is the right thing. That's the hardest part. Yeah, it really is. That's the hardest part is long-term perspective. I think is the biggest thing. Yeah. It takes five years to get any business going. It takes, um, there's 10 people in the world that golf is for freak shows. Yeah. But most guys, it takes five years to get to where your peak is going to be. So that's all relative. Like, I don't know exactly. I'm not a close baseball follower, but Freddie Freeman got it on the Braves when he was like 19 or 20 years old. But when did he win MVP? It took him about five years or Matt Ryan didn't win MVP till that kind of the middle of his career, even though he got drafted top five. Yeah. So, you know, it takes time to, for all the pieces, it takes time for results to show up. Like a podcast, like a podcast. <laughs> no, it really is. Yeah. It's compound. People underestimate the value of compounding. And people like to talk about it in investments. It's huge in relationships too. That's not my original concept. I read that somewhere. Like, don't underestimate the value of compounding in relationships. Everyone knows that if you put a little bit away over a long time, you'll have a bunch of money at the end. But that's true with building a skill set, a job, a relationship. Compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. That's that's a great takeaway there. So how do you think you know when you're on the right track? I have certainly, <laughs> being 38 and being in the position I'm in, certainly gone down some rabbit holes in the past. I moved to fucking China for six months, which, and the value of that is yet to be totally harvested, I'm sure. But at some point, if you're doing something, and, and golf's probably different, but like, how do you know when you're, what you're doing is going to have that compounding effect? How do you know when it doesn't? That's a good question. I think it's probably choosing the right thing and taking time to choose the right path at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. That Sam Altman guy says that people don't spend enough time choosing what to work on. Yeah. So let's say you're just going to work eight hours in a day. His advice is that you should spend an hour, let's say, or two hours at the beginning of the day thinking about what would be the most valuable thing to work on rather than just starting to work. On something. So if you expand that out to like a five year time horizon, you should really spend six months or a year thinking about what am I going to do long term over five years or 10 years as opposed to just jumping into something. So I think that's one way to do it. And you may be right and you may be wrong, but taking that time, if you have it, if you have the luxury of that, of taking that time can be really valuable. Sometimes you wait so long to put that first effort in. It's like, it, it makes it harder to go back and do it, do it from the beginning again. Yeah. Cause you might be wrapped up in something else that's moderately successful that might pay money, but you got to start over if you're going to get it right. Like you say, sometimes yeah, and the, that's hard. The flip side of that process I just described is just sitting around waiting forever. Yeah. You, know, you say, I'm going to take six months and really figure out what I want to do. Yeah. Well, at the six month mark, you can hypothesize for six months about yeah. what the right problem to tackle is. Yeah. But if you don't tackle one, eventually you're just a guy sitting at a coffee shop talking about ideas, <laughs> yeah, right? Which is what we're doing right now, yeah. but we're recording it. That's yeah. right. No, yeah. this, this is a perfect example. We had what two, three, four conversations about what this might look like. Yeah. 
that's really taking the time to chart a long-term path. And if you do a few, you can see some compounding growth. But eventually we had to do this one. Yeah. Like, let's just do it and yeah. see how it goes. Could be terrible, could be great. Um, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it yeah. too. Yeah. It sounds like you've covered almost all of the digging in here on this. You stick with it, have faith in knowing that what you're doing is right. I never think about it. Think about what you're devoting your time to. Let's pretend that golf didn't have the, the ROI that it does have right. in today's business world. I mean, let's face it. Right. If you're a good golfer in today's business world, it is the equivalent of being a mid-20s perfect 10 at a singles bar. Like, you don't have to do anything. You just go play golf. What and was that like for you to it be was, a mid-20s? Uh, it was tough. I just, 10. you know, could barely hold on to the job. And, <laughs> or I could barely finish law school because that was what I was doing. <laughs> uh, I was definitely on the other side. And, Lost more than I won, for sure. <laughs> it's a numbers game. Yeah, exactly. So, but let's pretend that it wasn't, it didn't have the direct effect. It didn't have, I'm going to keep working on this. My scores are going to get lower. Therefore, I'm going to get into better tournaments. Therefore, I'm going to make more money. There might be some cross-functional takeaways that pay off. And I guess that's what you're saying, too. Like, have they paid, have you seen how sticking with it, continue on valuing compounding, interest or compounding effort has paid off in another part of your life let's say it didn't pay off in your golf career well i think are you asking golf gives you feed the feedback is very direct golf. yeah there's a score on the board you can look up earnings on the internet yeah like nobody has to ask me like how i how i feel about my career doesn't matter you can yeah. look up the numbers most professions are not like that you could be the best lawyer at your firm for 10 years before you get recognized or vice versa. So is that kind of what you're saying? Cause I, I can yeah. see that. Sure. Yeah. Did How it. much has it paid off in your life outside of golf? Or in what way? I think it teaches you. I'm just kind of applying that playbook to the next phase of my career. Yeah. So we'll see, but. I already kind of see the lag effect working. Like I've been working on stuff for a while now and it's even our podcast course record show it, you know, it grows 20% episode over episode. And you look at the first few numbers and you're like, my God, we're putting a lot of time into this and nothing's happening, but it's growing. It's just like a network effect of one person tells another person. So that's one example where I've applied it. But again, nobody gets to see like in golf, how that's going or not. Yeah, there's a t dark side and a light side to the public nature of like if you're a business guy and you have a bad meeting or a bad quarter, that's not published in the, you know, you, everyone at the pool at your country club or in your at your neighborhood pool doesn't be like, hey, like sales were terrible for widgets last week, huh? Like you'll get them next time. Nobody says that to you. Now, the when upside's lower. It's like the downside. <laughs> That's the price you pay to have the bigger upside, I guess. Yeah. And it's not like those conversations bother me, but at all, they never did, but it's unique. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. And I'm the one doing it. So I have control. People don't think about their families or you know, if, if you're married to a professional athlete, you have no control over the results, yeah. but yet. You know, if you're Freddie Freeman's wife and he goes 0 for 60, she can't do anything about that. But she knows that everyone in the world knows that he's having the worst year of his career. So yeah, it's harder to not have control. Yeah, that might explain why it's harder to watch golf than it is to play. Hundred percent, hundred percent. That's yeah. why college golf coaches they have to do that times five. It's brutal. That is, brutal. and that's why successful caddies I think have very tight B personalities. They're very go with the flow they are not control freaks because your entire livelihood is dependent on something sure you're going to do a, try to do a great job and help your player but you have no control no control over how that player does maybe it saves a quarter of a shot every four rounds or something oh caddies can really help but yeah. at the end of the day the caddy can do all the right things and if his player has a bad wrist or has problems at home or just plays bad because golf is hard, what are they going to do about that? 
you have to really be able to like ride the ups and downs mm-hmm. as a caddy more than a player even really good way to articulate what a lot of people probably realize but can't put into words yeah it's a wild ride yeah do you have a quote or a maxim that you could trace back to the time that we've talked about that helped you or a story really you know my coach jeff he was watching some movie or maybe this was some like youtube clip that someone tried to encapsulate this where the guy's like driving down the road and he's like on a desert highway in a convertible and whether he's leaving his old life behind i don't remember what the story was but he sent me the clip or he told me about it and i think about it somewhere the guy just reached up grabbed the rear view mirror ripped it off the car and just threw it out the window and that to me is helpful you can't get rid of the things that have happened in the past, but you can't do shit about them either. That's pretty damn good. And I'm going to try and find that video now. Yeah. I, leave it in the description or show notes or whatever goes below this. Yeah. I think it's some movie. Like online. I'm picturing some seventies, you know, like big cutlass type cars. I don't know where <laughs> he a, found with it. an imposing rear view mirror. Right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Not like the one now that has like a computer in it. Like yeah. we're talking like Chrome rimmed. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have to take probably a baton or a, maybe a pistol and shoot the camera on your display to get rid of that now. Yeah. yeah. It's like, which I don't advise. No. Did you get any really bad advice at that time? Probably from the people at the pool. That's a good question. I think advice, I've been fortunate to know a lot of successful people that have taken the time to try to help me and have helped me a ton. I think the dangerous thing with advice including any advice I would give to somebody. So I try to preface it with, it's so biased by your own personal experience. Yeah, It's just impossible not to give someone advice that loosely mirrors your experience or what you did to be successful. And it could be good advice or it could be bad advice. So some things are kind of universal, but a lot of them are, are really specific to that person and may have nothing to do with you. Yeah. I like that Scott Galloway quote that he says, where he says, uh, anyone who tells you to follow your passion is already rich. And it's <laughs> so true. And there's some good, there's some truth to that and yeah. it's good advice, yeah. but it's so true. He yeah. says, find what you're good at, follow what you're great at, not your passion. Like, there's difference between a hobby and a job. And I try to think about that. I think he's right. Yeah. It's easy for Steve Jobs to say, follow your passion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If your if your passion is playing the spoons on a, I don't know, a cabinet, there's just not a market for that there's that, not, that I know of right now. There's not. And golf's a good yeah. example. You can have passion for it. Doesn't mean you have to play professionally. Doesn't mean you have to be in the golf business. Yeah. You can, I have tons of friends who never did either of those things. And golf is a huge part of their lives and they have a passion for it. It's just not the way they earn a living. Yeah. And I don't think enough as a separate topic, but I don't think enough young people are getting that advice on how to handle that as they come out of college golf or look towards the next thing. If I look back on my golf career and for those of you watching at home, you probably didn't know me from golf because my career ended after college, which was a very I don't want to say successful because one, that sounds like I'm tooting my horn and two for the level that I was trying to play at. It wasn't that successful. However, I look back on my relationship with golf and how I did it. And I wish that I would have accepted or maybe at least considered the benefits off the course, off the trying to win tournaments, everything that went along with playing in a tournament and the whatever character develops from athletic competitions it can be equally significant in your life. Here we are, right? Yeah. I mean, would we be here if we didn't play golf together? Right. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. But I think that applies, though, yeah. even if it is your job or if it is. Yeah. I think whatever your job is, if you can frame it as here are the results that I'm obviously trying to put the effort into and deliver. But through these challenges, I'm also going to get a lot of benefits that are not going to show up on the balance sheet or on my score. But when your head's in the sand and you're, you're grinding on that, it's hard to see that. Right. Like winning and losing in business or law or golf teaches you how to handle things that you can use outside of your 
profession. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's funny. I remember watching, of course I watched the 97 PGA last round replay ad nauseum because Davis won and he's a, he's a great friend to my family. <laughs> but I remember Ben Crenshaw saying, you have to keep your mind on trying to win when you come down the stretch in a tournament. You can't be, I don't think he said this, but you can't be dusting off the mantle thinking, am I going to win? It's I'm going to try to win. Yeah. And that actually applied to some other competition I was in in May in that I just wanted to win one match. And I had a, my first match I lost. But then the second one, I thought, well, I'm not going to make this about winning. I'm going to focus on doing what I think I need to do to win. And the funny thing is, the hardest thing about that is you're not guaranteed to win if you think about that. But it's almost easier to guarantee a loss than it is to win. And that's why it's so hard to think about, to me, yeah. to keep your mind on trying to win because it doesn't guarantee success. But if you don't do that, you're way more likely to increase your odds of losing. Yeah. So that... I'm just mirroring that story. My, that was my big takeaway from a big takeaway from golf that carried over for me. Yeah. Yeah. Did that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> so what role does it play in your life now since we're loosely talking about golf? About life. And that's a good question because I've tried a lot of different things. If let's say some of these public speaking methods, modalities, types of things that I've been working on don't pan out to make me a, an influencer. And that's not what I'm aiming at. In fact, I'm aiming in another direction Yeah, because there's so much empty rhetoric out there. Yeah. That's like, you know, try to shoot for the moon and if you miss, you'll hit the stars. But what the fuck does that mean? Right. However, by giving thing, these things a shot, they probably are useful in another arena. And if you can walk away there, then that's a win. Yeah. So I think it's putting forth the effort. If you have an idea that something might be something you want to go for, but also looking for the benefit for it outside of what you're aiming for. Yeah. yeah. It makes me Secret. think back to the thing I said about taking more time to think about what you're going to work on. Yeah. If I was going to say to error on one side or the other, I would say just to do stuff. Yeah. Right. D despite that, it really is. You, if you do anything, you don't know where it leads don't know what's going to come of it, but I mean, I've, that's been good advice that some people have given me around businesses. You know, I've, I have a friend who has a really successful financial data business. And he said, this came out of another business we tried to start that failed. And when that business, we were like, wow, that is not a market for that. <clears throat> that is not going to work, but I just figured out what might work. And that's a perfect example. What you're trying to do here might not work, but it might lead you to something that, that will work or that you find fulfillment in or yeah. success in. Yeah. And the example, actually, I just thought of was when I sent you the intro video for this channel. And I thought, well, maybe the content isn't as advanced as it will be or it could be. Yeah. But I took a different picture of my profile and I was like, I could use that instead of the old one I have for my LinkedIn or my and that just looks way more professional. Yeah. So that was a takeaway from trying that video. The video may not pan out, but at least I look a little less casual in my professional profile shots. More back to your kind of mid-20s perfect 10 days. <laughs> exactly. Not exactly, people. My peak, my peak is yet to be had. <laughs> Best days are ahead of me. Like a fine wine. Well, great. Well, man, thanks for getting in the weeds here with me. Yeah, this is fun. I'm glad. You know, I'm glad neither of us cried today. I don't think this podcast is ready for that. I saw a tweet that said, if you want to see two grown men cry, put a microphone between them and call it a podcast. <laughs> I haven't heard that many people cry on podcasts. I haven't either. In fact, I, I think that needs to be done more. Yeah. Well, I maybe Joe Rogan cried when he was talking about Anthony Bourdain, which with that step, step, now I'm stuttering. That is sad. That is worth crying over, yeah. but we're not going to do that today. No. But all right. So, Encapsulating all this onto a bumper sticker or a sign, what would it say? Good question. I would say just keep going. Keep going. Yep. All right. That's Phil. It's in Phil Knight's book, and probably a thousand other books, but I thought it was cool. He closed his book by saying, I don't really have any advice or I don't really have anything to share about 
what I've done or what, I don't think it was that special. My only advice is to just keep going. Yeah. And I think that is pretty much the best advice. That is. Yeah. That's the universal one. Earlier you said a lot of advice is specific to that person and what worked for them, but that's one that's universal. That is it, and it, universal to everything. Yeah. Family, professional. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of golf rounds that my mindset was average. Perhaps I got through maybe six holes and said, well, this isn't working. So I'm going to change it and do something else. And then it got worse. And it was like at the end of 18 holes, you look back, I looked back and thought, had I just kept going with yeah. that mindset, I wouldn't be eight over. I might just be one or two. Yeah. So that's applicable in golf and certain jobs I've had too, probably. I think I'm on number 15 right now. <laughs> if this becomes a job, it's going to be number 16. 16 right here. Um, okay. And then do you have any, there's a younger you watching or somebody that you feel like you could have some compassion for or responsibility for, what would you tell them? And you've kind of already said it, but let's do it more ceremoniously. Say that again. So there's someone that's watching, perhaps it's your 24 year old self, which you've kind of already described how you'd advise them, but, or there's someone out there now that's 24, maybe going through something similar. You said, keep going then, but how would you direct your, the way you said it to them? I would probably say that if your personality you have to know your personality. Are you going to try too hard? Or are you going to try too little? Yeah. Are you going to become overly invested in something or under invested? In it? Yeah. I would tell my younger self or someone that kind of fits my profile to not try so hard to back off, to not be so singularly focused. I'm, you're always going to err on, I'm always going to err on trying too hard versus letting things happen a little bit. Our yeah. mutual friend, Thomas, we haven't talked about this in a long time, but this happened in this kind of time that we talked about earlier when I was kind of banging my head against the wall in the main tours. Sometimes you just have to float down the river of life and just see where it takes you. If you're that certain personality, thinking about that is helpful. Like for me, that's helpful. If you're a person who, you know, maybe plays too many video games or just isn't as driven, you might need different. But if you're on the one side of the aisle, that's what I would go back and say. So kind of pick your head out of the sand a little bit more often. Sounds like you're not exactly saying stop trying. You're saying don't try so hard. Don't try so hard. And there's, yeah. there's a look around a little bit more. It's easy to get in your own head and ignore important people or important things or important moments because you're so focused on one thing and you miss out on those things and you don't perform as well. It's a double killer. It's like a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I bet there were times in your life where your social life was going well. Your social life kind of crosses over with your friends, your family, and your golf was all there was all going well. They oh yeah. All it's been good. <laughs> I know the camera's on, so it's kind of weird, but it's been really nice I to talk. Started with an empty <laughs> coffee. When we hang out, as we have been so much lately, we should do this more often. Just put it on talk camera. about stuff. <laughs> All That's right, a man. good way to kill the uh, thanks a lot. Kill the viewers. These guys again? Are you kidding me? <laughs> and that is the hard part with Roberto Castro. Thanks for joining. Cheers.